already. Perfect. <laughs> uh, hello, hello, Erin. Uh, geez, I think it's been November since I was chatted with you last, Harry Heapen. It has been a long time. I am, I am well, but it seems like you have more changes going on in your life than I do in mine right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Like literally probably like a month after I was talking to you. Um, yeah. Uh, we're all just, uh, got turned upside down and, um, yeah, heard the news about, uh, uh, me and my partner had a, a surprise um, conception. So <laughs> <laughs> all babies are blessings, and I am so excited for this growing family of yours. Oh, thank you so much, and I'm yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of uh, hear your insight as well, because obviously you've you've gone through the journey, and your um, well, your boys are teenagers now, are they? They are. So I have uh, 12 and 14 year old boys. Levi is 14 years old. Asher is 12 years old. They are totally separate, totally different from each other. And um, they are, they are joys. They are also, it is so much work being a mama, but it's also so much work having scoliosis and having this like kind of background fear in your mind of like, is my kid going to get scoliosis? And so I, it has been, a, it has been a journey to, uh, to work with them. And, um, neither of them have scoliosis knock on wood. Um, but as we know, they're 12 and 14. So time will tell if we are able to pass through the pubescent world, uh, without getting it. My oldest is good golly. I mean, he shows every sign of puberty and he's like, right there he's right there so time will tell so we've done a lot of functional medicine for both of them they had a lot of stuff going on so hopefully being able to fill some of those holes will be able to stave off scoliosis but time will tell so you know, I, could, yeah. I couldn't think of like a, a better mom to um have be equipped with all the knowledge and all the preventative and holistic measures to you know to help manage scoliosis even if they did have it your um your husband has a touch of it as well is that correct Aaron? he does you know it's interesting we did uh he ended up having three or four years ago about about of like really really bad back issues and so we ended up getting an mri for him and he had something called bertolotti syndrome which we found out didn't know that before where you actually have an l6 so you have an additional vertebra but it has been malformed and so like part of the uh, transverse process on one side is like connected to the pelvis. And I was like, oh, no wonder you're in so much pain all the time. And so it's been, it's been really interesting to gain this new information. And it was a congenital thing that happened when he was in utero and, you know, adds to the complexities of having, of having kids with scoliosis. And it, it definitely doesn't calm my fears down with my children, but so far they're really healthy and they even got braces on. I ended up going down that path, they had some, some crowded teeth and, um, an over jet. They both had, um, overbites and, uh, they have rubber bands and everything. And, and I know I actually, this morning was going through some new research. I just posted on social media, some new research, definitely correlating scoliosis and malocclusion and mouth stuff, which I've known for a long time. And I posted in my last book, I have scoliosis now what, and, um, and, interesting. but I it's had interesting. A braces as well at that age yeah. when, Actually, yeah, I had when I was in hospital with the spinal fusion, big set of braces yep. on me. <laughs> yep, yep, and so many people have them, and just more research correlating them. And so, I did decide to let them go and get them. And but like every month or two months, they have uh, a massage and uh, great manual therapists to work in their mouth, to work on their spine, to keep eyes on everything. I don't, I just don't want to be surprised. If I can catch it early. We're going to be just fine. So anyways, I digress on my whole story, but I also had a miscarriage before I had my son Levi. So I have been through it all. And I had, um, and then I gave birth to my two boys, 21 months apart during my pregnancy with Levi, my spine almost went straight. And then with my pregnancy with Asher, who is my younger one, my spine twisted up like a corkscrew. And so I've been through it all girl. 
Wow, so your spine almost went straight on the first pregnancy, Erin. Yes, yes. And I had had massages throughout all of it and I had great practitioners working with me through it. And she was like, your spine is like amazing right now. And I, you know, hindsight looking back, I think it was um, how my body was just acting with hormones um, and relaxing and everything. And I don't know if then when I had another baby 21 months later, it was just too much on my body. I didn't have enough nutrients in my body. I didn't know anything about functional medicine at the time. I think I was just deprived on so many fronts, including sleep. So sure. And pregnancy, you know, it's, it's hard on your body and, and 21 months isn't that long in between pregnancy. No, no there's no time at all. So and you, had a, you had a miscarriage, did you say in between that time as well? No, I had a miscarriage before, before Levi, who's my oldest, I had a okay. miscarriage. So, okay. and I got pregnant, it, oh. you know, you don't ever really know how fertile you and your partner are until, it until happens. you give it a try, <laughs> until it happens. So, you know, it was like, it was like three months after my miscarriage and it was like, I don't know, let's just see. And then the next month I was pregnant. I mean, you just don't plan for that. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my word, we are so fertile. That's <laughs> like, hilarious. No problem. But you know what so, I've heard that of? Like a lot of people actually is like, people have been like trying and trying and trying for ages and all their energy is consumed in that. And then all of a sudden when they just like let go and relax a little bit um, and just don't worry about it, that's when they actually conceive. Totally. Totally. So many stories like that. So many stories. Okay. So I have some questions for you since you are, are you 33 weeks pregnant? Am I 33 happy? Am I weeks. Yeah. Going on. Uh, <laughs> I love it. So now you're getting into lots of changes, lots of changes. Lots of changes. I was just at a breastfeeding class this morning and I've learned a whole lot of new information. That's, um, yeah, a lot to take in. <laughs> so like, wow, I've got my work cut out for me. <laughs> it, is, it is all good. So what has been the biggest surprise for you being pregnant with Scully? The biggest surprise I would say is probably... I don't know if it's a surprise or I knew it, but um, I, I find I have like a, I have a lot less control over my core now than I, I would have had pre-pregnancy. And a, a lot of the things I would have done um, before pregnancy to kind of maintain my core strength, um, I can no longer do um, either because I have like, you know, bulging in my midsection and I don't want to uh, exacerbate that uh, with, you know, all the stuff that can happen afterwards. Or it's like, um, yeah, simply like the strength is, it's not there anymore. So I, I've been very kind of like humbled by it and having to go back to like very, very basic movements, uh, even just kind of core breathing and stuff like that. Whereas before I, I used to be able to do like, you know, calisthenic stuff more advanced stuff and it, it always really helped keep my my back in good shape um so yeah I found like I have struggled a bit more with scully pain since uh yeah not being able to do my regular core stuff during the pregnancy agreed on all fronts it's I I think my scully got a lot worse after I gave birth to my second son, um, because I didn't have the strength. I, I just uh, didn't have the abdominal strength. So because the front abdominal muscles were no longer as strong as they needed to be, all my back muscles took over and any discrepancy that you have in back musculature, convex is going to be a lot more powerful it's going to be a lot more active and firing concave is going to be a lot slower to fire and so you get that kind of dysfunctional firing pattern and you're tired and you're breastfeeding and you're waking up multiple times in the middle of the night to pick up these things these kids of yours and then 
especially when you have another kiddo, the, you know, screaming at the library, not wanting to go down for a nap. The last thing you're thinking about is engage my transverse abdominus, come out of my scully curve. You're like, oh my gosh, give him something to eat. Get him out of a public space. Let's <laughs> go for a nap. And then all of a sudden you get an x-ray and you're like, what? How did my scully progress to these? I know. When did this happen? Because, yeah, and this, uh, as we discover, like when you have kids, you have less time for, for self-care measures. But 100%. I mean, still, still extremely important to add them in. But I think you have to be a lot more, a lot more intentional about it after you become a mom. Yeah. It, even actually this last weekend, my kids finally went back to school. And I looked at my calendar and I was like, oh, I've got more free time. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, but I have all this business stuff I have to do. I was like, I recognized inside me that I did not have the motivation to work out myself. So I just started booking myself with privates with all my staff because I knew, I knew that I needed to do it as a mom and the motivation was not there. And th that's the snowball. That's what happens. You're like, oh my goodness, I have two seconds to breathe to myself, where I don't have to cook a meal. I don't have to help with homework. I don't have to bring a kid to cross country practice. You're like, I just don't even have the energy to, to motivate myself to do it right now. But you know, you have to do it. Completely. Like, I feel that way. Like I'd be fairly well kind of self-motivated to kind of like uh, work out like as in weight train or go for a run but I find it very hard to motivate myself to do like relaxing things like uh, i.e pregnancy yoga or you know things that are going to say like induce oxytocin in your body which is what what I've been uh, told is what you need before you give birth so I've booked myself into classes so that someone else will will run the class and then I just have to go and do it because I know if I tried to do it at home, um, I would get distracted and I, I wouldn't stay in it and, you know, every excuse in the world. So sometimes you're better off just paying the money and, you know, keep putting it in the hands of someone else. Amen, sister. I'm glad that you recognize that. Okay, so I've got, I've got another scully pregnancy question for you. What are you scared about? What are you most scared about having scully and being pregnant? I don't think I'm too scared about it getting uh, worse, but um, I suppose I am. Uh, uh, I am scared about having like this uh, ongoing back pain, um, you know, after birth. Because at the moment, um, I suppose what I'm experiencing is like I've always like had. Uh, I've always had like very uh, stiff, um, sometimes like spasming. Uh, QL uh, kind of erector sp spinae muscles like on the left side of my body it's something that I've just always had with scoliosis but I'm able to manage it quite well with um, you know like trigger point and exercise and yada yada but it's gotten um, it's gotten much worse um, especially in this third trimester since like my belly has grown and I have a bit of anterior pelvic tilt now and my posture is changing and uh, I've noticed that the symptoms that I had before pregnancy, they've just kind of gotten worse now that I am pregnant. And sometimes I, I they're, quite, they're like the worst in the morning time. So I wake up and I have this like burning sensation, like almost like a stinging, stinging, burning sensation in that side of my back. And it's, it's really, really painful actually, but it don't, it's only that sore kind of first thing when I wake in the morning then once kind of I get up and I'm on my feet and stuff it's okay um but I suppose my fear would be that my my back will continue to be that way after pregnancy that it won't go back to how it was before where it was just more like of uh more of an annoyance rather than an actual pain if you get what I mean totally when I was pregnant I had searing nerve pain down both of my legs and it was just my sacrum, my, my body's already hypermobile. And so then you add relaxin into the mix and you get joints that are really, really hypermobile. I mean, I wasn't sleeping more than just a, a few hours a night at a time and, um, or a time at night. And it was, it was just hard. I will tell you 
it will not keep going on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What's this thing and you leave? <laughs> Your body has to figure it out. Your body's changing every single day. You will get your body back and you have the tools to get your body back. You have people to help you figure out all the little nooks and crannies to help you get back to where it was. So yes, it is an amazing thing when your body is pregnant, especially with Scoli. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. But like what I keep reminding myself is this is what we're designed to do. Like mm -hmm. whether you have scoliosis or not, we're designed to, to, birth humans and and the fact that we can actually do it with having this you know curvature in our spines well it makes us bloody warriors doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> that was so great oh my goodness <laughs> it does it does eva yeah you know it, over my years of working with people with scoliosis fear is the number one thing that i see in people either scared to get pregnant or scared during their pregnancy or scared after their pregnancy or scared for birth um because i know you don't have any metal in your back anymore do you have you thought about your your birth plan and i know it doesn't we don't always get our birth plan but do you have an idea about how you would like birth to go of course yeah um i mean i'm flexible and open because uh you know things change and sometimes quick decisions have to be made and stuff but um, I have been studying, I've done a course in hypnobirthing and I quite like the idea of having, you know, a natural unmedicated birth. Um, you know, in Ireland here, you're allowed to um, labor in, uh, in the water pool, you know, whether you're doing home birth or hospital, I'll be in the hospital. So I would like to be in the water because I find the weightlessness very good. Um, for the back, you know yourself. Um, and yeah, I I'd like to do it preferably without um, without drugs, but at the same time, um, if it's needed, um, I, you know, I obviously would get whatever is available. I actually have, um, I have an appointment with the anesthetist um, in a couple of weeks because they have to check, even though I don't have metal in my back they have to check if they can still insert the epidural because um um i believe they inserted in between l3 and l4 and for some people who are fused they might have to insert it somewhere else or even see if they're a candidate for an epidural um have, have you heard about that yes and that's one of the reasons that i was asking i am so proud of you that you are going and having a a, a consult and a meeting with an anesthetist so yes, it's a big thing. I actually put it a huge thing about pregnancy in my last book. And I asked a bunch of people and um, e there is even some research that I cited uh, about people who've had been fused. So common knowledge is common knowledge in the medical world and the research world, which the more people I speak to who've had this done, they're like, uh, no, not at all, is when you have a fusion, you have to have a C-section. That because they are unable to get into the uh, into the back and give you an epidural. Mm -hmm. So that being said, when I asked a bunch of people on social media one day about this, every single person was like, "Well, they said having um, an epidural was not an option for me because metal was in the way, or the spots have been closed up due to bony fusions or whatever. If they've had a fusion." And so most of them chose for a natural labor, not a C-section. Wow. Okay. I know. I was, and all of, I, I think the people that I spoke to and the people who commented on social media, all of them were just fine doing a natural birth. And even, I know you guys have different healthcare in Ireland, but in America, many of them were able to get, um, all their expenses paid for, uh, a home birth or for a natural birth because they could not get an epidural. So, oh, wow. um, oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Like a doula was paid for and a midwife was paid for a bunch of other things were paid for because of their medical condition. And I had never heard of that before. They had to jump through a bunch of loop, a bunch of hoops to make that, 
um, viable. I just thought that was the coolest thing. But yeah, it's common knowledge where if, and I'm glad you're going to get it checked out, if you have had a fusion, past or present metal in there, um, you need to have a consult beforehand to see if there is, it is possible to get in there. And another thing is, um, at some hospitals in the United States, again, I'm not sure what it is in Ireland, um, they will have kind of ranking of anesthetists that are available to give epidurals in a hospital. And most of them, you know, oh, another lady's in labor. It's just a common thing. They'll just have the lowest person on the totem pole go in and give the epidural. If you have scoliosis, you need to ask for the physician, like the the physician on call, like the highest managing physician of the anesthetist team to do it. Um, and if you don't have a consult beforehand, then you need to bring your x-rays in so they know what they're dealing with and they can figure out from your x-ray in your birthing room what exactly they're dealing because sometimes you may have a consult with an anesthetist and it's time for an epidural and somebody else walks in and it wasn't the person that you spoke with so if you have your x-rays and your partner who's with you your husband whoever is with you as you're like exhausted and delirious they're just like here are the x-rays and you're just set sure and is that for um that's for fused and unfused spines erin is it yeah, so I would recommend anyone that has scoliosis when they go in, if, especially if you're unfused and you know that you want an epidural and there's a high likelihood that you'd be able to get an epidural um, to bring your x-ray in and just have it with you, like pack it in your hospital bag and it's just there and ready. I mean, my desire was to have a natural labor and, <clears throat> you know, sometimes we don't get what our desires are. Sure. Yeah. I labored for like 17 hours and like, it just wasn't happening. And luckily I had a doula with me and I was like, just have me. I'm, I was so tired. I labored all through the night and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I didn't even know my name at that point. I was in so much back pain. And she was, I was like, just, it's time for a C-section. I cannot do this anymore. She was like, oh no, we'll just go get an epidural. You'll take a nap for two hours and the baby will be out. And that's what happened. Fantastic. And so, Fantastic. yeah, yeah. So having yeah. somebody there um, to advocate for you when you just can't, like the last thing you're thinking about is making sure that the epidural is at the right place. Sure. So, and that's one thing, like, um, I don't know if you've ever studied hypnobirthing, but a big, like, um, a big thing that they talk about is like writing out your um, birth preferences before you go in so that, um, you know, if option A doesn't work, it, like, it's not saying that like you have to have, an, um, a natural birth with no medication but it's it's saying like okay if you can't do this um this is what i would prefer for option option b if i have to have a c-section this is what i would prefer and it's just putting like the power back in your hands so that you know you, you have a positive birth experience and i think yeah having having the x-rays is just like having yourself prepared for the best success going into um deliver your baby 100% on all fronts. Um, yeah, I had a weird epidural on my first, on my first birth and, um, uh, with Levi, my 14 year old and, uh, the epidural was on for so long. Like I couldn't feel my legs. Like they had to go in multiple times. And this was it, it, like, in I, I I gave birth at Vanderbilt, which is a teaching hospital. And so I don't know if I got somebody that should not have, like that was a resident and they weren't a full doctor. I don't even know what was happening. Um, but it took almost 24 hours for me to be able to feel my legs again. Oh, and then a nurse in the middle of the night, I, I clicked in, I rang to them that I needed to use the bathroom. And a nurse came and she was just kind of like holding my hand, walking me to the bathroom. And um, as I was squatting, like slowly bending my knees to use the toilet, she didn't have a good grasp on me. And one of my legs gave out on me because I didn't, I still couldn't feel one of my legs very well. And so she didn't have a good hold of me. And um, I swerved to one side and one half of my pelvis slammed against the side of the toilet and so 
I had just, I mean, I had given birth like I don't know, less than less than 24 hours ago. So my pelvis was really mobile. And one pelvic half of mine slid down. Ooh. Um, and all I had torn during labor, totally TMI, and all of my stitches came out. Oh God, love you. So, oh, that was it was so it was a it, it, yeah, going into my first year, my first few weeks of motherhood was hard. Um, but I, I say all this just was this connected to the scoliosis that I had in my lumbar spine? I don't know. You know, I, I have no idea. Um, my, my spine got a lot better during my pregnancy with Levi. I have no idea. Or was it a, were, was the faulty epidural, a uh, fault of, um, you know, the, the doctor or the, or the resident that was giving it to me? I don't know. But I just, I think from my experience, I'm like, just everyone just who has, if you want an epidural, which I definitely, I just walked in with my second one and I'm like, this, I know my body needs it and I've been through a lot of trauma. So we're just going to go ahead and do it. And it was, it was, I learned a lot and everything was like smooth sailing with my second one. I was like, man, that was not my first one. Just have your x-rays ready. Just have your x-rays ready. So it's, you just taking, taking a variable out of the situation. For sure. Like that's, that's an absolute golden nugget is just, uh, yeah, know beforehand, like if you are a candidate for for it or not. So then when you go in, you can say yes or no, and then uh, make sure that it is the, the head anesthetist or whoever is administering the epidural, have them do it. And yeah. It's go, and go, go scoliosis, go. yes, and, and they should know. I mean, I know that they know that scoliosis is just hard when you're giving epidurals. So just go into it fully knowing that that it's going to be hard. And so you just want someone who's done thousands of these. And they're like, I got this. No problem. It's kind of on an angle. It's up here on, you know, it's, it's an inch higher than you thought it was going to be. It's going to be to the left an inch more than you thought it was going to be or whatever it is. Don't, don't be having a resonant do this. Learning on you for the very first time that, you know, oh, look at this. I get to learn on someone. I've never worked on someone with scoliosis. It's going to be a great learning experience. I'm like, no, 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 no. no. This is the last thing you want when you're like six centimeters dilated. No, thank you. No, <laughs> you're in too much pain not already. Doing that. <laughs> not doing that. So what is, what is one thing, one piece of advice now that you're going through it that you could give the scoliosis community who are thinking about becoming pregnant or are pregnant? Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Erin. Um, well, it's kind of, I suppose, the same piece of advice that I generally give to anyone with scoliosis. Um, but like literally the best thing you can do um, if you're trying to get pregnant with scoliosis or you you are currently pregnant with scoliosis is just try and move your body in some form every day. Um, and it's something that I've always known, but it's been kind of reiterated to me during this pregnancy is like if I have a day where I'm like very stationary I'm not moving around a lot like my body like really just feels it and I feel my scoliosis and um I just I feel compressed um I feel achy I feel stiff um but if I make a conscious effort to move every day and um move quite a lot like um I find like I probably need more movement in my body than probably the regular average person just to feel kind of normal, I would say. Um, and if I don't get that, I'm just grouchy. And um, I feel like this pregnancy would probably have been a lot worse um, if I wasn't able to be so active. So I'm really, I'm actually really grateful for being able to move as much as I have, because I know a lot of people you know, with different complications and stuff, they've been told to like go on bed rest or to that they're not allowed like much activity. But like, if you can, and you know, your your healthcare provider says it gives you the all clear, um, just make a conscious effort to move yourself every day. It doesn't have to be intense exercise. Um, it can be like going for like regular walks. You know, your Pilates, your bit of weight training. You know, there's things away training as well. Like you're going to have to adjust it as you go on. But uh, bottom line is just keep, keep moving, keep the circulation going, keep the blood flowing. And that's going to help. Um, that's going to help mitigate any um, 
any you know different symptoms you have going on with your scoliosis beautiful word agreed on so many fronts <laughs> and especially especially in the third trimester i mean second trimester your body is changing third trimester man that little that little person inside you is growing so fast in Thank size you. every day your body's going to change it's going to change pelvis, legs, breasts, arms, how your head hangs on the body. So every day, just even if it's just a little bit before you get out of bed in the morning, just work on moving your body a little bit. Completely. I found like the third trimester, I have been like stiff as a board and I've never normally been like very stiff. Like I do a bit of stretching. I'm like, oh, that feels good. But uh, like since the third trimester I'm like oh the relief my hips <laughs> my back is <laughs> just like yeah uh, stretching in the and morning your body is you have to your body yes your pelvis is expanding getting ready for labor and it's supposed to do that in addition your body's gonna feel it completely mm -hmm. um and what about you Erin what would be uh, what would be your advice for someone with scoliosis looking to get pregnant or is currently pregnant? You're going to get through it. It's going to be okay. That, that is my advice. So <laughs> many people come to me, they're so scared. I had a woman who I, I worked with. I, I, oh, Eva, I get so many people who are with a partner and they think they're going to get married and then they're going to get married and they're like seven years before they're even planning on having kids and they're already worried about their body not being able to handle pregnancy or birth. I had a virtual client like two weeks ago. She was like 22. She was like, my mom is so worried about me and having a baby someday. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm like totally out of left field. And I was like, tell me more. I was like, do you, do you have a boyfriend? Like, she's like, oh yeah, we've been together for a long time. I was like, okay. Like just waiting to hear, like, I'm like, where is this fear coming? She was like, my mom, my mom's an OBGYN. My mom is an on-call, is, it deals with babies every day and births babies every day. Okay. So her mom has seen people that have scoliosis. And so her mom, her mom and her mom's fear has been put onto this 22 year old. Oh, that's all. I'm like, yeah. I know. And I was like, wow. I was like, this is complicated. And I worked with her and I handed off to one of my teachers after I worked with her virtually for a lesson. I was like, baby, I was like, you are so strong. You are so flexible. You will be just fine. She's a reformer at her house. I was like, let's just keep working. I mean, if you want to work out, let's, let's, we can do this weekly. She was like, yes, my mom's going to pay for it. I was like, Okay. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, it, like, there's, there's people, there's people with Scully who have, like, you know, I know a lady in, in Ireland, Deirdre is her name. I, I'm sure she won't mind me sharing her, but she had, like, very bad scoliosis, like congenital, and, you know, had multiple surgeries, like magic rods put in, rods taken mm -hmm. out, like, and it wasn't until she was, um, I think she's almost in her 40s like by the time she was actually able to conceive and she never thought it would be like possible for herself just because of her long long complicated medical history but um you know I, I always think of Deirdre she's really inspiring like and I think if Deirdre can you know get pregnant and give birth and have a baby then I, I, I think pretty much most people with scoliosis can totally 100%. I had a client that I worked with for years. Um, it was just, it was, she, she had, she had uh, a large goal, two large goalie curves, but um, had, had, she was, gosh, by the time she moved to another state in the United States, she's maybe 28. Um, she had had seven different spinal fusion surgeries. Oof. It was just a bunch of not great doctors making some decisions and doing some surgeries and then rods breaking and screws breaking and it just it was gnarly she is 34 weeks pregnant right now with her husband and oh, you're just like 
Yes. And she's radiant and it's beautiful. And she didn't know that she didn't think this was ever going to happen. And here we go. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Your that buddy, is what I have Your buddy to was designed to do this. Yes. You're going to be okay. I don't know how your birth is going to be. But you know what? You're going to have to do some strength work afterwards. And I'm going to tell you a secret. Everyone that gives birth has to do that afterwards. It's not just people with scoliosis. And if they don't, then they're going to pay the price down the road, which they do because they all end up in my studio. And I'm like, so it's, you know, I think with scoliosis, we get so worried that our scoliosis is the root of the back problems that we're going to have that we've already like anticipated having down the road. And I'm like, you know, if, if you ask so many people that didn't have scoliosis, how was your pregnancy? How was your back pain? How was your labor? How was your post, uh, post delivery? They're, they're all going to complain about back pain. They're going to complain about pelvic pain. They're going to complain about not sleeping. Many of them are going to complain about nerve pain. Like, oh, uh, maybe my scoliosis isn't just the sole root of why I feel like this. Because everybody does. I don't want to diminish that, yes, your left QL pain, your left erector pain, that's scoli related. You know, there are things that we experience that are going to be solely because we have scoli, but we can all have babies. It's fine. It's okay. It's okay. And like, you know, stuff like sciatica and that, um, they're very common symptoms of pregnancy, whether you have scoliosis or not. So to blame it all on the scoliosis, I don't think is is reasonable either, because there's just so much other complex things going on in your body that are causing these changes to happen. 100%. I worked with a woman at my studio and she, I'd seen her like three times over the last two years. She would just come in. I give her some homework exercises and she'd do them at home. She'd come in for checkups every once in a while with me. And then she came in at, she was like eight weeks pregnant. I was like, girl, I don't even know how you're here. You're, they're so tired. You're so tired. And she came in and she was so scared, like terror in her eyes. That she was pregnant and she was, she had scoliosis and it hurt her scoli wasn't even that bad. And I was, I, I was, I literally probably talked to her for 40 minutes and I probably did like 15 minutes of exercises with her. I was like, oh, a lot of what you're experiencing right now is fear, is not physical pain, is fear. The fear. Right? And I saw her, yeah, I saw her like maybe two months later. Actually, she probably gave birth by now. Just realized that um, I saw about two months later and um, her fear was lessened, but, but she came and she was like, oh my gosh, I'm having this pain in my leg. And it was just, I was like, it's, I was like, you have a tight hip flexor. It's okay. Like, we'll just go stretch it out. It's going to be okay. Just like on fears on just high alert for so many people that have scully. And it's so great to hear that you're not, you're like, I'm going to work out. It's going to be okay. Yeah, you know, it's interesting about the fear thing as well, Erin, because uh, I know I keep going back to the hypnobirthing course, but at the start of that, they actually make you write down what your fears are, like whether you have scoliosis or not, they make you write down what your fears are about being pregnant, labor, um, postpartum. Um, so you write your fears on one side and then on the other side, um, you know, you write out things that you can do to help alleviate those fears uh, so for example if it's like left QL pain spasming my back will never get better and then the other side like maybe you put I don't know the self-care things you can do the stretches the mobilization the massage like and it's basically just like addressing your fears uh one by one so that they're actually down on paper they're out of your head and then you also feel a bit more in control about what you can do about the fears. That is brilliant. And I wish that more people did that. I, what do you think? Can you, can you walk people through that one more time? Because I truly, truly think that everyone that has scoliosis should be doing this. 
when they know that where there was someone that they're going to have a family with, or they want to have a family with, or they're ready to start trying, or it just happened. Fear is so huge, Eva. Okay, let's hear this one more time, because this is so important. And everyone who's listening, you need to grab a pen. Even if you're like 15 and you're not <laughs> pregnant, write in your journal for someday when you are. <laughs> one day you will be. <laughs> um, one day it's going to be super important. Okay, so walk people through how this would happen. Uh, okay, go on. So, um, yeah, so basically in the hypnobirthing, um, they are teaching us, uh, well, they are asking us, like, basically, what are, what are your fears? Um, like, what, what is, what is holding you back during this pregnancy? Or what is causing you to kind of stay awake at night? Um, and, and for you, Eva, would you mind sharing what were some of your fears? What did you write down? Would you mind sharing that? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound like um, maybe, uh, I don't know, a bit selfish or whatever, but uh, my, I, I'm like quite, uh, I'd say it naturally, like quite an introverted person. And uh, one of my fears is that like once I have children that um, I'll never have, you know, time back to myself again to, um, I suppose, like, you know, recharge and, and fill my own cup. Um, mm -hmm. And then one of the ways that or uh, one of the things I wrote down to help resolve that issue was um, making sure that I have my support network around me um, to maybe hand baby off for, you know, half an hour to an hour if I if I really need just some time on my own. So having my partner there for support, having my mom uh, you know, um, looking into crash options or Montessori or a babysitter, but um, having these people are around you um, in case you, you just really need that time just to decompress. Um, yeah, that was. I, I, I will tell you, it's not an in case. It's a promise that you'll need <laughs> that time, girl. <laughs> I'm really glad you're thinking about that. So you're not surprised when you're like, I haven't had the moment to myself. I'm like, no, my kids are 12 and 14. I don't have a moment to myself. <laughs> my husband was, was talking to our 12-year-old Lynn last night. <laughs> I heard him say something in the other room. I heard him say, mom. I was like, I don't know. My husband's in there. I don't have to deal with it. And he came back in and I was like, what did Asher say? He was like, is mom just overwhelmed and exhausted right now? <laughs> my 12 year old said. <laughs> Whoa, well, how like aware of him? <laughs> I was like, please tell me that you just like defended me and no, I'm just tired. <laughs> I didn't, I'm not overwhelmed and exhausted from our 12 year old. I'm like, baby, when, even when your baby is little and when your baby is 12 years old, you're still gonna need a break. You're still going to need your mom to help you. You're still going to need school. And it's it's okay. Completely. It's okay. Those feelings are real. Um, and I'm they sure are. You, really, you really probably feel that at the moment uh, during the summer holidays uh, versus when they're in school. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> it's so real. All right. Did you put anything else down on your fear list? Um, yes. Um. This is more, this is actually not really related to scoliosis, but um, uh, another one of mine was like, uh, I can't, again, I think it's kind of more a time thing, but um, not having the time to uh, train for ultramarathons because ultramarathons, they, they take up a lot of time. They're like, you know, you're hours and hours and hours out running. And uh, who has that time with, <laughs> who has that time with a newborn? So that was actually like when I first found out I was pregnant, it's going to sound so silly, but that was like the first thing I said to my partner. I was like, no, I don't be able to run ultra marathons anymore. <laughs> and um, he was like, it's real though. I'm so glad is. that you thought through that. When I, when I danced with the Rockettes, um, there were a few moms that made the decision to come back and work and dance after they had kids and they were always exhausted in between shows they would like literally sleep underneath the chairs and underneath like their our makeup stations and our dressing rooms because they're just so exhausted because the minute they get home they're mom oh they're mom God. they don't get to sleep yeah. they don't get to go home and take care of their bodies because their babies want them 
So it was interesting seeing that and um it really it is such a luxury like uh for <laughs> I suppose for people without kids that they can actually like decompress in their spare time but for for parents it's like your 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 off time is 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 now your your on time and your on time in work and stuff can sometimes actually be your off time correct correct <laughs> and you can embrace it and and embrace mommyhood or it'll be a big fight and you'll end up um uh being angered that you have children that have taken away your time I uh, know you gotta you gotta surrender to it because like as people keep saying like the time is is short that they're they're in that stage where they need that full-on attention and care um but you know if you don't give them that time like you will you will regret it when you're when you're older you know and you will always have that time when you get when they get a bit older and maybe they don't need you as much as they did when they were when they were little Um, i'm glad you were honest with your feelings these are these are really good things was there anything else that you wrote down um what else uh I think another one was, um, so like, uh, I have, a like my partner has, uh, two kids, a, a four and a six year old. And, um, that, uh, when I first, uh, like moved here and moved in with my partner and stuff, I didn't really have like much experience with, uh, like, you know, I was like babysat like nieces and stuff like that but I didn't have like very much experience like uh you know living with children or that even though they're only with us like kind of two and a half three days a week um but it was like a a lot for me to get used to like four-year-old and six-year-old energy um and um I found myself being like very very uh overwhelmed by it at the start I'm like oh my god am I ever going to get used to this this is so uh overwhelming for me um so yeah one of my fears was like that uh compounded with having a newborn um I just feel like I'm going a bit crazy <laughs> um, but um yeah I think it, it 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 can be manageable as well in the sense that um you know I can like my partner can always take them out if I need some quiet time or um, I can always go and stay at my mom's with the baby if I need some quiet time. So there's ways of working around things just because you have like, you know, a fear that you don't think can be resolved. There's always something that you can do to um, to help help it be a bit better. It's not going to say that the issue is going to be completely resolved, but there are steps you can take to make it slightly better for yourself. I love that you're facing these these fears and they're real I mean they're totally real yes there's so much energy and so much crazy energy we actually put a climbing wall in our house when our kids when my when yeah when my when Levi my oldest was five the energy was insane in my house and I was like what is happening so we put a climbing wall in our house we, my kids have jumped through three huge trampolines. Um, like wow. we buy them and they jump on them so much that like there's holes in them. And I'm like, okay, this is dangerous. Your leg could get caught in here. And so we've, we're on our third trampoline. Um, and we just like, we actually just put in a pool in an ingrown pool outside because now they're older and they still have this energy, but now they're teenagers. And so how do we you know, a little tiny climbing wall. I mean, it's not little tiny, it's like 15 feet high, but even like, you know, my 14 year old now can jump up and grab the top one. So it's not a way to get out energy anymore. Sure. And so to, to, for me to be able to be able to, uh, to take a deep breath and for them to be able to handle their energy, those are real issues that I have had to, I as well have had to deal with. That's interesting, actually. My uh, partner was uh, like uh, talking about getting the climbing wall installed in. It seems like a really good idea for um, for you know toddlers slash young kids. Like God, it, it it sounds like and it, and it works as well if it's rainy outside. Like you know, it's still totally. like they can bounce off the wall without having to go outside. We um we had that, and then we got a huge like four inch thick like drop mat that went underneath it. 
so that they could d climb up, catapult themselves off of it onto the floor, you know, and I'm like, whatever. I'm like, I'm not micromanaging you when you're out there. We even got like a little trampoline for inside the house. Um, man, we got a little jungle gym for inside the house and we just had a whole room that was like kid world. You got, if you have psycho energy, I'm like, just, just go run. We actually had um, both my boys eventually got facial stitches because they were so, they had so much energy. My boys are good boys, but they, they had they just so much boy energy that they would just like run around the house and catapult themselves from thing to thing. And, you know, all of a sudden I look over and my kid's head is bleeding and I'm like, okay, I have to go to the hospital, seven stitches in the eyebrow, another one, four <laughs> stitches in the mouth. I'm like, what is going on? But <laughs> no one said my kid doesn't need Adderall. My kid needs a way to get energy out. So, but now yeah, it's so real, Eva. But That's now nice. my fourteen-year-old, who is the, the the master of all this energy, now he's a hardcore stamina distance runner. Wow, a distance. So, runner. so I, you know, you see the progression of all of that. You know, like last year, his mile was like five thirty. And that was before he even started doing hardcore training this year. But that's, but you see the crazy energy when they're little, when you're like, I am so tired. I just need a break from you. Completely. Climbing all little trampolines, put them in there. We're good to go. And know that the energy will be used for good as they're older. Like we got, a, I got like a little bouncy chair when he was in kindergarten. Like, uh, I think actually, I think you're sitting on one right now, like a bouncy ball. <laughs> and I got him one. I asked this kindergarten teacher if I could get him one. She was like, well, would you buy him for everyone in the class? I was like, I will happily purchase one for everyone in class. If you will let my son Levi have one. And so I just, when they were younger and I would put little, they're like TheraBands. Uh, we got TheraBands for the bottom of his um, desk. So he could kind of bounce his feet on them during the day oh, when he just had a lot of energy. A idea. Wow. Yeah, I would. It was cool just to find out all these little things. And you're like, oh my gosh, my kid has so much energy. I need to calm this down. And I was like, well, maybe we don't need to calm it down. Maybe we just need to kind of, you know, change the path a little bit. And then you see him now, he's at a college preparatory school with an intense distance runner. And it's like the coolest thing to now see. I was like, oh, so I just had to figure out how to handle his energy and calm myself down in the process. <laughs> wow. Get him through the phase until he could handle his own energy later on. Cool for you. And now it's been channeled into this amazing sport that he obviously yeah. has a very natural gift for. And you just, you know, but when he was little, oh girl, that was hard. That was hard. And I did not have much, under, I did not have much time to myself. You're I right. could imagine. And um, how did you find your uh, managing your own scoliosis during that kind of chaotic period of young, two young children? I did not. <laughs> I'm very honest with you but that is why when I wrote my very first scoliosis book I was like well I need to have an x-ray so I went out and got an x-ray I think Asher my youngest was like three at the time maybe he was two I couldn't find any x-rays my mom didn't have any x-rays when I was younger and didn't didn't keep them I didn't get them from the doctor and so um, I went and got an x-ray and I was diagnosed at age 14 with a 17 degree upper curve and no lower curve and then when i got my x-rays after asher was um two or three and levi would have been like five or six four or five i can't even do the math right now um i would have been in my late 20s at that time my scully had progressed 35 degree upper curve 25 degree lower curve wow and that's a big progress happened like that and um and it was me just i was overwhelmed with my kids with my, their energy and, and taking care of them. And I didn't have time for myself. I didn't make time for myself. We didn't have family in town. And, you know, I was running a Pilates studio and I just didn't, t I just didn't take care of myself. And so, but I, as an adult now, I was able to decrease my curvature. My upper curve is in the upper teens and my low curve is below 10. And so I, I now know I have to take care of my back. I have, that's why I say you have to have a scully schedule. You need to know how often you need to do what you need to do. Your Scully dream team, who do you need to go see to keep it managed? And I, I can keep it managed now. I just, like what you're talking about, I'm like, I, I just wish, I wish someone had sat me down when I was 33 weeks with my first baby and been like, hey, it's not an 
if you're going to need time. It's a promise. You're going to need time. It's a promise you will have zero time unless you just put it in your day. You know, be like, hey, mom, can you take baby two days a week for just two hours? You just put it in the schedule and then you're going to be a better mama afterwards and you're going to be able to take care of your back. Completely. Yeah, I think um, that along with what we were saying is is good advice for people looking to get pregnant or are pregnant is um, even maybe before you have kids like ha- have these have these things ready or have this like movement schedule and you know the you know your your scoliosis dream team ready for when that chaos inevitably strikes <laughs> after you, you have the baby so that you know what to do um you're not going to learn it not to say that you can't after you have children but it certainly is like a bit harder to find the time time wise so kind of having that um scoliosis kind of care established i think before you you go on that journey that's yeah that's huge it's so so important. yeah just like you have to put date nights in with your husband and your your significant other it's not like oh maybe we're i'm like no your kid's gonna be with you unless you schedule a date night to babysitter it, date nights will not happen unless you schedule them because you will always have these people with you unless you schedule time for someone else to be with them and it's okay <laughs> it's the same thing with i mean it's not an if they're going to be with you i'm like they I promise that they will be with you and it's the same thing with um with with caring for your back you just got to do it so then we're not surprised that all of a sudden, even though the, sur- the the surgeon who looked at you when you were 14 years old told you that your scoli was never going to progress, and all of a sudden you've had a miscarriage and two kids, and it's, you know, 15 years later, and you are totally shocked that your scoli got so much worse. I'm like, no, 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 no. We are all over being shocked. I am over people being shocked that their scoliosis has progressed. Friends, it will, unless you take care of it. If it doesn't, you won the magic lottery. But I'm like, we don't have to live in fear over it. We just have to plan. We just have to plan. We just have to move. We have to get massages. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And it's a non-negotiable as well. It's like brushing yeah. teeth. You have to do it. You just got It's like brushing teeth. <laughs> that is perfect. Yes, it really is. It really is. You have to you have to care for your back. Otherwise, it will get worse. And I don't know what will happen when it gets worse. It can get worse in a lot of different ways. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, so, like, it's hard on the body anyway. Like after you kids, you're rounding a lot to pick up little people. You are breastfeeding. You're picking things off the floor. Like your back is bent over a lot. So I would argue it's probably one of the most important time in a woman's life to um, care for care for her body and and keep her her back and her core muscles really strong. 100%. You know, I, I didn't have help. Um, none of my family, none of my husband's family was near where we live. So I didn't have any help when my kids were little. And I, I hope one day that when my sons are married and have children, that I am able to bless them with what I did not have if my children choose to live in the Nashville area. Because their lives their lives will be better if they get help your life eva will be better if you have help not because you can't do it but because if you have people that are around you that love you that 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 want to spend time with your beautiful baby then you get to take a deep breath and care for yourself and then you will be a better mommy completely and it's not selfish to take that time um you you have to see it more as you will be a better person. You'll be a better partner. You'll be a better mom, better friend, better work coworker. Like you'll just be a better person when you have that time to give to yourself. Agreed. Did you have any other fears, or can you whip past the rest of the 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 activity that they made you do? Um. Well, one thing actually, um, and I don't think we we've tapped on it yet, but um. And and it's not something I've really thought of so far, um, but you probably have had a lot of people come into your practice um, with the fear that um, their children or their children's children will be passed on the gene of, of scoliosis. I think that's that's a big fear 
with people. Um, is there any research on that, Erin, or uh, what 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 have been your experience or findings on uh, on this little uh, li this little statement? <laughs> 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 One of my favorite topics. You're going to have to cut me short here, Eva. So um, that is, I think, one of the biggest fears of why women with scoliosis choose not to have children. Because they don't want to give, they don't want to risk giving their children what they have had to suffer through. If they have it within their power to withhold that suffering from someone, which is like a huge complicated ball of emotion because we don't know if that's gonna happen or not. Um, one, of my, uh, one of my clients who now actually works for me, she's a phenomenal teacher and she's the client care coordinator at my studio. So if you contact my studio and you will probably, you will probably end up speaking and emailing with her or having a lesson with her. Um, she's a beautiful, gorgeous person. And she has, she has definitely a pretty gnarly lumbar scully curve. And she helped me write chapter 13 of my latest book. I have scoliosis now what, which is the root of scoliosis. And we spent together. It's actually probably better that we didn't calculate how many hundreds of hours um, going through research. In that chapter alone, we have 350 research references on what research has found is, is the root of scoli or the multiple roots of scoli. One thing that we do know is that um, there is not one specific scoli gene. Their research, so much money has been spent on research to find the magic scoli gene and it doesn't exist. There are multiple genes that can go into it. Um, I mean, the desire would be like, oh, we can find this, the magic scoli gene and then we're gonna be able to find the magic medication to make that one magic scoli gene turn off. And all the genome testing that has been found that, that one magic gene doesn't exist. What they have found is about 28 genes that epigenetically kind of can work together. If you have seven of them, you might end up with minor scoliosis. 14 of them, you might end up with more severe scoliosis. And it is a myriad of those things that work together or lack thereof that can end up triggering scoli. It can, some of those different SNPs and gene variants can include the MTHFR mutation. So that is, you do not methylate B9. You don't methylate folate well. Mm. I have one of the MTHFR mutations. And so I have to take a sublingual MT, uh, L methylfolate supplement every single day because I don't, I can eat as many green vegetables as uh, I want, but my body does not have the ability to break that stuff down and methylate it into usable folate for myself. Oh, I, don't I don't have that ability. Uh, These the genetic testing showed me that. So I just take a supplement every day to supplement that. There are uh, lots of different research showing that there is um, lots of different dysfunctions in gut bacteria, lots of dysfunctions in our detox pathways, like how well we detox estrogen or lack thereof how well um what are some of the other ones uh histamine how we deal with histamine is another one um how we uptake vitamin d how we deal with melatonin um so there's the list is so long i really if you if you're planning on having a baby and you have this fear about about kiddos um passing it on for real you can get on amazon you can like get it in kindle form for just a few dollars i have scoliosis now it just goes directly to chapter 13 and um i have just so many different research references to get her um this client now she's the employee of mine her husband's um a, a doctor and we he helped us put in all the different testing of if you don't want to go to a doctor, there's a lot of different places that you can order different tests online. They're just sent to your house. 
about uh, to check your vitamin D, to check all these different things, check your genetics and all these things. So you can you can make sure that your levels are where they should be. Because I we both have a theory that we can have all these SNPs and even we can hand off these genetic variants, these genes to our kids because it's 50-50 if they're going to get them from us or not. But just because you have a gene doesn't mean it has to manifest into something. So that's why I did all this functional medicine work with my kiddos um, so that I can get all of their levels, all their nutrient levels up to where they need to be. So when they go through that arduous journey of going through puberty, when they need all these, this extra help, um, time will tell, can we, can they get through puberty without their body kind of breaking down and scoly forming? Interesting, Erin. It's really interesting. And so like kind of empowering as well that like, there are there are things you can do um, to help prevent the scoliosis. Um, even uh, you know, even if your children like, if they're not showing signs of it, there's ways that you can you know mitigate it. And if they are, there is ways that you can like mitigate it. Also, it's it's such a it, it's totally. so awesome to know there, that you're not kind of just like left in the hands of of you know a, a medical professional to like you know tell you what your fate is um yeah and, and it's, it's on you. i will say that um the my client and i my employee of mine now and um and i we went and did this chapter and sifted through all this research out of fear out of fear for our children i, I mean that we we'll, we would both so honestly tell you that that we don't want our children to have to live with what we live with and we have fear that they will. And so as parents, you know, we'll do anything for our kids. We'll, we'll go in front of a, a moving car for our kids. And we would rather take the damage instead of them. So that's why we sifted through all this stuff. And so we both have implemented all of these things into both of our, uh, well, we have four children between the two of us. And so time will tell if, what happens, but we, there are both of our kids, both sets of our kids are so healthy. And so I am, I am quite hopeful, but there are a lot of things that you can do and living, sitting and um, just sitting in your fear is not going to, it's not going to be helpful. It's not going to make things any better. What you can no. do is buy Aaron's book. I have some <laughs> <laughs> she was you know, a money mess in the book. It's actually it's so fantastic. It is like um an encyclopedia for scoliosis. And um that's only one chapter, but there is like like it it is a manual for handling scoliosis. So do 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 check it out. Um it's um yeah, it's probably one of the most detailed books I've ever seen on the topic. Um it's so so helpful. So if you are worried, if you have a concern about any of these topics, do check out the book because it, yeah, <laughs> it is great. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's a journey. It's a journey. And I, I think the reason that I wrote the book was because of the emotions that I saw from people. Um, and there's no, there is no reason for us to live in constant fear over having kids or raising children or our own bodies or our children's bodies or our grandchildren's bodies be because we have the tools. It's not 40 years ago. It's not 20 years ago, Eva, when you and I, when you went through all of your surgery and your hospital stuff, you know, it's not, it's not 20 years ago when, well, it would have been 30 years ago at this point from 30, 25 years ago for me, when, you know, when I was just totally ignored. They're like, ah, you might have some spinal fractures and you probably have scoliosis. Don't worry about it. Don't come back to us unless you hurt. I was like, okay. So, you know, how, how our bodies were treated were absolutely at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Totally ignored. And then lots of, lots of intervention. And I'm not saying either one is necessarily bad or good. It's just that those are our stories. What can we learn and how can we change next generation? 
things have like come come on so far, Erin, from what they were back then. Like I, I, I couldn't even imagine then like having you know a type of Pilates that's specifically for scoliosis, um, like or even like an exercise, just a general exercise that was for scoliosis. I was like told when I came out of hospital. Um, okay, you should just re- refrain from doing like high impact activities. Definitely no rugby. Uh, definitely no jujitsu or martial arts. No horseback riding. It was like a big list of no, no, nos. And like, um, and th- then I was told I could do a bit of walking. I'm like, okay, that's great. <laughs> I'm 14. Like, um, what am I supposed to do with that information? So thank God things have come on so far since then <laughs> and you're like I can walk well I'm going to be doing ultra marathons now <laughs> be careful what you recommend <laughs> <laughs> no it's so good it's so good I um I worked with uh recently a, a fencer she was a d1 college athlete fencer she did fencing and, oh cool cool and I mean, it went totally into her scully curve, 100% into her scully curve, but she knew it. She knew it and she knew her exercises. And I'm like, great. Just like, don't horseback ride, don't run, don't jump on trampolines. You know, the list is so long. I'm like, well, you know what? You love fencing. I would also add on there, don't fence if you go into your specific curve, but she loves fencing. So I was like, great. You don't want to give up fencing? Okay. Well, what do we need to do to support this? Running. You love to run? Okay. Horseback riding. Oh my gosh. I don't know if it's just because I live in Tennessee. We have so many teenage girls who love to horseback ride. And I always ask them like, how much do you love to horseback ride? They're like, ah, I love it. Okay. Well, we're going to keep horseback riding then. In addition... This is all the homework exercising that we have to do in order to be able to do that. Yeah. So good for you, Eric, just have like, you always take that joy away from people. Totally. I'm like, baby, I'm just like you. You get out of the hospital and everything's stripped from you, and you're like, I'm I'm 14. You're like, what? I can walk? I'm 14. That's all I can do. I've been in a hospital how long? No, we're not. And it leaves you in such fear as well. Like uh, I like literally. Uh, I didn't do any activity for um, four years after that until I was 18 because I was literally scared that um, I was going to damage, re-damage my back again and need more surgery if I was to do anything. And um, it played into like my confidence in my body um, because I wasn't moving, I wasn't active, um, made me like really not want to try on clothes in the shop um it just it it impacted everything like so I'm just so glad things have changed since then like I don't even remember receiving any physio treatment after um spinal fusion like it was really like very backward in Ireland back then in the early 2000s so um yes thank god things have changed and people advocate for exercise with scoliosis now well, actually, in the United States, I am quite certain there is still no physical therapy after you get out of surgery. Really? Yeah. I think they have inpatient physical therapy to help you get out of bed and to make sure that you can walk, make sure you can do stairs, make sure you can, like, lap the hallway. But I am 99.9% sure that once you are released from the hospital, there is zero outpatient physical therapy. That is crazy. That's yeah, insane to me. Like, what about your core? <laughs> like, that just—that's the time when you need it the most. Just like after you give birth. What about your core? Exactly right. Completely. Exactly right. Completely. It's it's destroyed after. Well, not destroyed, but like it's it's vulnerable after you know surgery. Yeah you need to build it back up again internally and then externally it's, yeah on all fronts I don't even know if we finished going through everything with your uh with your hypnobirth um 
uh, little thing that they made you do. But I, any, any last, any last things you want to say about that for everybody? Oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll just finish it off. Like, so basically, yeah, you, you write down what your, uh, what your fears are, even the little ones, you just get them all out on paper. And then um, on the other side of the paper, um, you write down, um, you know, possible ways that you can um, overcome it or help uh, manage it or things that you can do to um, make it better. Um, so what you find then after having this long list of fears, so you automatically actually feel better once you like dump the fear out and uh, maybe actually like talk to someone about it because it gets it out of your um, out of your body and your mind and <laughs> onto paper or you know talking to someone about it um and then what you find is once uh once you've written down like the possible solutions um or ways to manage it that um it it's no longer uh it's no longer a burden for you anymore and you, you actually feel a bit lighter and you feel a bit more empowered because now you know like if this thing crops up um well it's not like it's you know fate happening to you but you know you actually have some tools that are within your control to, um, you know, t I suppose to help uh, overcome the fear or at least have things to do, ways, ways to manage it if it does pop up. So I think it just takes like a really big load off your chest um, and um, it doesn't, it just doesn't weigh you down as much anymore. You feel, you feel lighter of heart after it. It's so beautiful to hear that they had you do that because the, the activity that they had you do for birth, I wish that every single person who cares for someone that has scoliosis would have them do the exact same thing. Scoliosis being the intention instead of birth being the intention. Completely. You have, a, you have a bit of a section about that in your book, don't you? You have a fear section in your book. Yes. Yeah, I have a, an emotion section. Anger, sadness, fear, all of them. And it's real. And I think once you, for birth and for having children, it's so much, whether you have scoliosis or not, you add scoliosis onto that and it's so much more. And then just living with scoliosis as well. If we don't deal with these fears, they overwhelm you. I was working with a woman. She came in from Florida to work with me and she worked with me for two hours in the studio. And so I have this list of things. I'm like, okay, she came in from out of town to work with me. I'm like, I got to go fast. We got to get through all these exercises. She literally just talked with me for an hour and a half. She was, she, she had so many fears, so much anxiety about living with scoliosis. And I was, I, I really wanted to be like, okay, we can talk. I was like, can we move and talk at the same time? I was like, we've got a lot of stuff that we've got to get through, you know, to give you, to empower you in order to go back to Florida and do all these things on your own. I was like, we can keep going virtually and that's fine. But it just shows you how many fears we have while we live with scoliosis. How many fears we have when we're about to give birth, when we're pregnant. Get them down on paper. Follow Eva's protocol, everybody. Completely. And sometimes there's like a little fears you have that you mightn't even realize you have until you take the time to put awareness to it. Um, yep. And those little things can like kind of just sneak into your subconscious and you don't even really know that they're there. So just getting it all down on paper. Oh, yeah. it's a form of therapy. It, it is extremely therapeutic. So yeah, anyone oh, totally. who studios, do it. it. It will make you feel so much better afterwards. And a lot of the times I think people realize that a lot of the fears happen because A, they don't have education and B, they don't have a plan. Completely. Once you have education on or realizing that you don't know anything about this, of course you're going to have fear. And then B, you have to have a plan. Once you have a plan, life is a lot better. I think about, I think about um, my, my son, Levi, he started taking French a few years ago at school. It is not his favorite language. I don't, languages are not his thing. And so he had, he would have so much fear over the test. Well, it's because he didn't know it. The, the education part. And then fear of like asking for help. So 
We got him a tutor. Amazing. Life got so much better when you knew the information and you asked for help and you received the help and all of a sudden the fear goes away. It's the same thing with giving birth. It's the same thing with having scoliosis. We don't know the information and we don't know who to ask to get help. Once you have that in either having a baby and giving birth or having scoliosis, a lot of the fear just goes away. Completely. And I think the more you start kind of like delving into um, the resources, like you will find the the right people to help you along your journey. And the more you read and the more research you do, the the more you, you'll, you'll naturally find these people along the way. Um, so yeah, knowledge reduces anxiety. And then, as you said, having, having the plan and having the right people to help you with that is just, um, it's, it's invaluable. Oh yeah. Well, I am, I am so excited to hear about your journey over the next few months and you guys, you guys are going to have a lot of fun changes in your house soon. And I hope that in maybe a few months after you give birth, we can, we can do another uh, podcast to find out how you're doing and to find out how your journey was, because it's going to be a fun journey, no matter what happens. Oh, thank you, Erin. And I would love that as well, because I'm sure we'll have uh, at that time, probably more little golden nuggets to share with the scoliosis <laughs> world, but maybe like uh, navigating postpartum with, uh, which with is, scoliosis, yeah. which is no, amazing. and that postpartum is such a real deal. And I feel like so many people, A, in the like, majority of like the female world a they don't talk about postpartum but b in the scoliosis world i mean who talks about postpartum in the scoliosis world nobody i have really bad postpartum depression with my kids and nobody talked about it nobody talked about it It was so real and so it was a very lonely time period i'm like oh no if i just had the tools if i just had the tools to figure out how to go forward it would have been life could have been much easier it's yeah and it it is it's a very real concern for a a lot of women like and putting scoliosis on top of that dealing with chronic back pain every day is uh it's not a walk in the park so um uh, yeah I'd love to hear about your journey with that Erin in our in our next podcast that would be really cool I love it I think it's great and I hope that people feel empowered by what we talked about because I honestly I have never heard of people talking openly in the scoliosis world about pregnancy and birth um and it's something that needs to be spoken about and you know in a doctor's visit it's like 10 minutes and it's a male doctor most likely they've never given birth you know and I'm not saying they're bad people they're just men and they've never given birth and they don't have scoliosis, most of them. And so it's just a very female oriented topic and it's a big, heavy topic. So I hope that people were able to pull some golden nuggets out of our conversation today. Totally, yeah. It's crazy to me that it isn't more talked about because it's a very common thing for women to get pregnant. Uh, with yes. And it's a very <laughs> common thing for women to cho- choose not to get pregnant because of the fears with scoliosis. and. It would really just break my heart to think that someone like that might be something that would stop someone from, you know, you know, being being a mother. So I'm I'm glad we had this conversation there and hopefully it uh, helps some people out there to, you know, make the right choice for them. Yeah, I had um I had two clients come to me years ago that is th- this advice was given to them many, 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 many years ago. They're like 50 now they ended up not having children because their doctor told them that they should not have children. Oh, no. oh, that's awful. No. You know? And so the, the trauma that was left from that, I was, I like, didn't even, I always have words. I love words. I have a words for everything. I probably have way too many words for everything. And I had no words when I heard that. So I'm like, I'm very grateful that we're getting this topic out in the open and we're talking about it. And I hope that people, that people, talk about this it's real and it's it's so real talk about it come talk to us if you want to talk about this completely yes if if anyone has any questions message me or Erin um maybe I can also compile a list of questions people have and then we can we can discuss them on our next uh on our next episode great we should totally do that yeah if people have questions about any of this stuff let's talk about them let's talk about it because we got to get this out I I want I want 
people, we don't always have control over if our spine is going to become perfectly straight or not, or even during curious curvature, we can do as much as we can do. And oftentimes we have success with that. What we do not know for sure, but what we are in control of is our mind and our emotions. And that we can be in control about. And I think getting all this information and getting all these fears and all these topics out there start to start to bring everything that's been submerged in the scoliosis world to the surface to be dealt with. Amen, sister. All right. Well, <laughs> I pray blessings upon you and your labor and your partner during this. And I cannot wait to see the face of that beautiful little baby after you give birth. Oh, bless you, Erin. You're so kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. And I'm excited for your journey. And um, I'm just, enjoy it. Enjoy, Thanks. Enjoy the hard. Enjoy the easy. Enjoy the sad. It's a, it's a miracle. So enjoy your little miracle that you're experiencing. Thank you so much, Erin. I really appreciate that. And uh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'll uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch for sure, uh, and we'll organize another podcast in in a few months down the line. Sounds good. All right, bye, friend. Bye, whole scoliosis community. Bye, guys. Thank you so much, Erin. <laughs> you're welcome. I'll talk to you next time. Go on, Erin. Look after yourself. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye.